So welcome to this uh, third lecture on wireless communication where we continue uh, talking about the wireless channel. The topics I will cover today are to some extent covered in chapter 3 of the book and I really recommend that you read these highlighted sections from the book. Today we will talk about wideband and narrowband communication, Doppler shifts, resolvable paths, the general formula for time varying channels which we've briefly covered in lecture 1. Uh, and also we'll talk a little bit about Rayleigh and Ricean channels. We'll also cover uh, autocorrelation and power spectral density of wide stand stationary fitting processes. This is what we've seen last time. So the channel in principle is given by Maxwell's equations, which you can simplify to ray tracing, which you can s further simplify to the combination of three effects. First effect is path loss. This is the deterministic decay of the power with distance. Uh, given by this equation here, where gamma is called the path loss exponent, it determines the slope of this yellow curve. Then we have shadowing, which is due to large-scale variations of the power in the environment. So I can show this by this curve here. So large-scale variation in the of the power. This is modeled as a log normal random variable, which in the dB domain is a normal random variable or a Gaussian random variable. Um, here the mean is zero because the, the average power is given by the power due to path loss and this is then the additional power due to shadowing has mean zero and a certain variance sigma squared or psi here. So then I could write the total received power due to path loss and shadowing uh, by this expression, the dB domain. The final effect um, is multipath fading and these are uh, very small scale variations of the received power on the order of a wavelength and this is due to mobility and small changes in the environment such as reflections and scattering of, of objects and this will also be modeled as random and this will be the main topic of today we also saw this slide last time where we uh, talk about uh, wideband and narrowband communication so wideband means that we send a very short pulse at the transmitter. In narrow band, we send a very broad pulse at the transmitter, so this would be time. If you send this very short pulse, you will receive um, all of these multipath reflections here. So each of these paths corresponds to something in the environment, to a bounce of some object. When the transmit pulse is very long, like shown on the right, you will receive all of these paths lumped together. So that this total duration would be the same, but it would just appear as one path. If the receiver is moving a little bit or something is changing the environment, in the wideband case, things would look more or less the same, small variations. But for the narrowband case, the power can fluctuate a lot because all of these paths, they will add up coherently or incoherently and lead to large fluctuations. So this means that when a user is moving, then over time, the power would vary. So this is what is shown here on these figures on the bottom. And these are two different time scales, so it depends um, on a number of parameters how quickly this power changes over time. And we will cover this soon. Now, the basics for the multipath fading is a Doppler shift. So, as you may recall, when a transmitted signal is sent at some frequency and um, a receiver is moving with some velocity in some direction, the received signal will arrive with a Doppler shift. And this is the same effect that you have when you, an ambulance drives by. When it's coming towards you, the frequency is increasing. When it's driving away from you, the frequency is decreasing. This Doppler shift depends on the carrier frequency, speed of light, and the angle of the transmitter with respect to the receiver. So this angle is shown here. And this can be greater or uh, smaller than zero, depending on the velocity, well, depending on this angle, theta, of course, we see that um, when the velocity increases, this means that the Doppler shift will increase. Also, when lambda decreases, this also means the Doppler shift will increase. This means that systems with uh, small, with high carrier frequencies, which have smaller lambdas, they will suffer from higher Doppler frequencies. Now, to get a feeling of how important these Doppler frequencies are, you can consider this example where we have a one gigahertz carrier a user moving at 75 kilometers per hour and the question is what is the Doppler so you can try to solve this yourself and then come back to the video so 
So we recall that when the carrier is one gigahertz, this implies that lambda is 0 0.3 meter. When V is equal to 75 kilometer per hour, this applies that V is approximately 20 meter per second. Okay. This you can do yourself. And then it follows that FD, which is V over lambda at most, right? It can be smaller depending on the angle. Um, this will be approximately, and now this is very rough, uh, 60 hertz, right? It's 20 meter per second over 0 0.3 meter, so about 60 hertz. Now, what is important that this is that the 60 hertz is way smaller than this 1 gigahertz. So it's a very small deviation here. But when you increase the carrier a lot, then this deviation will become more important. Right? So if you take a 30 gigahertz carrier, then you can compute a Doppler and it will be much larger. Now, in practice, you will not just have this line of sight path from transmitter to receiver, but your signal will bounce off objects in the environment. Each of these will have a different angle. So each of these will have a diff different Doppler shift. And this is what we'll see now. So now we consider a scenario. Okay, let me try to draw a picture where there's a transmitter somewhere here. There's your car. Somewhere here in some direction. There's some angle theta for the line of sight path. And then in the environment, there's some objects. And for each of those objects, there's a path going to the receiver. So let's say the receiver has an antenna here on the back. Right, so each of those paths has its own angle, theta. Each of them will have its own propagation delay, tau. And each path will have its own path loss and shadowing alpha. Right, and we have multiple paths, so we'll index them with n. Good, so now in the more mathematical terms, we have here the transmitted signal, which is upconverted. And uh, so U of T is the complex baseband signal, S of T is the passband signal. This goes over the environment and then we look what the receiver observes. So in line of sight, which means that there's only one path from the transmitter to the receiver, what the receiver will observe over time is the transmitted signal, which is delayed. It is delayed because the user is moving. So over time, this delay will increase. In this case, user is moving further away. So that's why we have this tau of t. The signal is also affected by um, a power loss. And this here is um, shown as path loss and shadowing. So here, maybe it's also important to mention that this alpha is the amplitude. This means that alpha squared will be the power. Right, so when we talked about path loss and shadowing last time, it was referring to power. So the amplitude is the square root of that. And this uh, path loss and shadowing will also change over time, right? Because when you're moving further away, the path loss will increase, and then the shadowing is a random process. This will vary. And then finally, you have the um, frequency component. So you have the received signal, which has the same carrier frequency, but is subject to a Doppler shift. And then, of course, this T will become T minus tau, right? Because the signal, again, is delayed, and this also manifests itself in the phase. Sorry, let me remove this. So this is what the receiver will see as a received passband signal plus noise, of course. Now you see again, there's all these effects, the delay, the amplitude, and the Doppler. Now each of these are not changing very quickly. Right? The delay changes based on the speed, so it's kind of moving, changing slowly. Path loss is also changing slowly, and the Doppler shift in this case could be constant. So what now gives rise to these rapid variations of the channel? This is really due to the fact that in practice you have many paths. So let's say you have n paths. So in this case we had one, we had n equal to five paths. Then since this uh, communication system is linear, what we will receive is the superposition of all of these paths. So we'll receive the sum of these paths. And each of these paths is of the same shape as the line of sight path, but with its own delay own amplitude and own Doppler shift. And again, we have the delay. 
So what I do now is I pull out this uh, a to the power j 2 pi fct, right? I pull this out, put it here. So then what is remaining, this here would be the complex basement. So this is the received signal in complex basement, ignoring the noise. Now, what we would like is to have an expression, as we've seen in the first lecture of this form, right, where you have the transmit signal, and then you have the time varying channel. And now you can easily see that the only possible expression for this C of tau and T is given here. So it is the same as what is in the green box, so a superposition of paths. The only thing that's different is that I have these delta functions here. So the channel is basically a sequence of pulse impulses with different delay, different amplitude and different phase. Uh, maybe it's also good to mention what this phase is. So let's see here, phi n of t will be everything in the exponent here except to the thing that I pulled out. So it will be 2 pi f and d t minus tau and t minus 2 pi f c tau and t. And now it's important to recall that this value is very large, right? This is many gigahertz. So this means that this will be uh, rapidly fluctuating. Right. As soon as you move a wavelength, your phase will rotate 2 pi. All right. Anyway, so the, in the end, we get this uh, time varying. Uh, well, this is actually the time varying channel. And to verify this, if you plug this into here, you will find what is in the green box. So as we already hinted at before, the, the channel breaks down into two cases, the, the narrow band and the wide band regime. So here we'll try to make this a bit more mathematical. So in this box here, this is the physical channel. So this is what's given by nature, right? and also based on the, the velocity that you're working over. Um, well, it partially depends on nature. The only thing that matters here actually is this free, the carrier frequency. So this is what matters here because this will affect how this channel looks like. <clears throat> and in this channel, there are two dimensions. There's the there's tau and t, so the delay domain and the time domain. And I'll show you a picture of this in the next slide. So we can study this channel in two ways. We can, um, well, let's first go to the left. At a certain time, we can study the channel in the delay domain. Okay, so this would look something like tau. And then we have c of tau at some time t, and this channel would have some impulses like this, right? Where the first one could be the line of sight path and then different reflections. For this channel, we introduce a concept called the delay spread. This is expressed in seconds and it's the time between the first and the last arrival. Oh, I made my figure a bit too small to make it really useful. So let me move it here. This is tau. This is C of tau at some time t. So this is fixed. You can see this as this is the channel today, and then the channel tomorrow could be something different. And this consists of some impulses like this. And then this time here is called the delay spread. Now, um, this delay spread actually tells you a little bit also about the propagation environment. So for instance, um, let's see if for a good example, let's say indoors, right? In a, let's say in a lecture hall, the difference between the first and the last path could be about, let's say 30 meters, right? Because the, there's a line of sight path and then it bounces off some wall and comes back to you. And the difference between those two paths is 30 meters. So this would correspond to um, 
10 nanoseconds. Nanoseconds. So this means that in indoor environments, you know, that are not too complex, maybe 10 hundred nanoseconds is reasonable. Outdoors, outdoors, um, you could have maybe a path that bounces off a mountain and comes back to you, then it could be three kilometers, right? And then it would be a delay spread of, what would it be, 100 times what I had before, so one microsecond. Okay, so the delay spread tells you a lot about the environment. I think my first 15 minutes are up, so let me see, I can break the video in two. See you soon.